Hello and welcome back to Calculus. We are going to cover section 1.3 today, which deals with evaluating limits analytically. You only have to watch part one for tonight's homework. In section 1.3, we're going to look at evaluating limits using properties of limits. We're going to look at how we could maybe develop a strategy for finding limits in general and how to evaluate limits when we're dividing out or um, using rationalizing techniques. We did do a little bit of this last year in pre-calc, uh, but I'm guessing some of us maybe didn't remember that. And then we're also going to end the section, which will be in part B, with evaluating a limit using what we call the squeeze theorem. So let's start off by looking at the properties of our limits. Now, I know we've already talked about this some, but we've, we've discussed that even though a function may not exist at a particular point, and let's call that point C, we can still have a limit. Now, the thing that we haven't hit up that much, uh, especially this year, is the fact that a function can actually, or a limit will, can actually occur just by plugging in that C value. And if you recall from pre-calc, when we could plug in the C value, like in this case right here, Okay, we call that direct substitution. So we say that the limit can be evaluated by direct substitution just by plugging this value here into this function right here. And when we have what we have something like this happen, then we know for a fact that that function is continuous at that point C. And it actually works out really nice when that happens. So some of our basic limit theorems say that if b and c are real numbers and n is a positive integer, then the limit as x approaches c of some real number b is actually b itself. Likewise, the limit as x approaches c of x equals c, and this is because of direct substitution. Or I also have the fact that when I take the limit of an exponent, or the limit as x approaches c of x to the nth power, that's really the same thing as saying c to the nth power. And again, that's due to direct substitution. So if we look at example one, the limit as x approaches two of three is three itself. And if you think about this, we would say that f of x is equal to three because this is our f of x value right there. And if I draw that, that's really like saying y equals 3, or it's a horizontal line through 3. So as I approach, or I take the limit from the left or the right, let's say of 2, so as x approaches 2, which we'll say is right here, as I come in from the left or the right, I'm still approaching 3. So that's why that works. Now for part b, I have the limit as x approaches a negative 4 of x. Well, if I use direct substitution and plug this negative 4 in for this x, I'm going to end up with a negative 4. Likewise, for part c, if I use direct substitution, I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared, and I plug in that 2, and I square it, that is really going to give me 4. Now, some more properties of limits that we have. Okay, we still are assuming that b and c are real numbers and n is a positive integer. And then f and g are going to be two functions. And the two functions, when we take the limit of them, I have the limit of f of x as x approaches c is going to equal l, as in this case. And when I'm taking the limit as x approaches c of g of x, this is going to equal k. So now that we've got that established, our properties say, and here we're going to look at the scalar multiple, if I'm taking the limit of a scalar, then I can take that scalar itself, which in this case is b, and just multiply that by what my limit is equal to. So I end up with b times the quantity of my limit. If I'm adding or subtracting functions, then it's going to be the, the limit as x approaches c is going to be the addition or subtraction of the limits themselves. If I'm taking the product of two functions, so I have the limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x. That's the same thing as taking their limits and multiplying them together. Same thing with the quotient, which is what I've got here. The only exception to that is that k cannot equal 0 because we don't want to have an undefined function. And our power property says that if I have 
the limit as x approaches c of a function raised to the nth power, it's the same thing as taking that limit and raising it to the nth power. So you say, how does that work? And I'll tell you, let's look at example two. So example two says to find the limit as x approaches two of the quantity of four x squared plus three. Now technically we can break this up using the properties that we just learned. So we can break this up into the limit as x approaches two of four x squared plus the limit as x approaches two of three. And because of this right here being a scalar, I can really rewrite that as four times the limit as x approaches two of x squared and add that to, now I'm taking the limit of a constant number here as x approaches two, so I already know that this is going to, this is the same thing as I ran into in example one. So this is going to give me three, and now if I simplify that, the limit as x approaches two of x squared, that's going to give me four times two to the second power plus three, and if I simplify all this, I have four times four, which is 16 plus three, or I get a limit that is equal to 19. Now for those of you that like the quote unquote shortcuts, we also could have done a direct substitution from the very beginning, and with the limit as x approaches two of four x squared plus three, if I did direct substitution, that's the same thing as going four times two squared plus three. Or again, I have four times four, which is 16 plus three, which also gives me 19. I'm gonna guess that most of us are gonna do it this method, but you could actually break it down like we did in the first part. Theorem 1.3 tells us that if you have a polynomial function, and c is a real number, then when we take the limit as x approaches c of that polynomial, we're going to get the polynomial function evaluated at that c value. Likewise, if we have a rational function, which if you recall is the quotient of two polynomials, then we're going to be able to plug in that c value into both of our um, polynomial functions, and we'll get p of c divided by q of c. So example three then says find the limit of the rational function um, as x approaches one of x squared plus x plus two divided by the quantity of x plus one. So again, using direct substitution, we're going to end up with one squared plus one plus two divided by one plus one and one squared plus one plus two is going to give me four divided by two, which is equal to two. Theorem 1.4 deals with um, the limit of a function involving radical functions, and it says let n be a positive integer, and the following limit is, a val is valid for all c if n is odd, and it's valid for c is greater than zero if n is even. Now remember, if you're taking an even root, you can't take, for example, a square root of a negative number or a fourth root. So even radicals have to be greater than zero, and if it's odd, you can take an odd root. Like, for instance, you can take the third root of a negative eight, and that will work. So that's all that means. Theorem 1.5 deals with composite functions. And it just says that if f and g are functions and the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals l and if the limit as x approaches l of f of x is equal to f of l, then the limit as x approaches c of the composite function f of g of x, then that's really equal to the function f evaluated at the limit as x approaches c of g of x, which is really equal to f of l. So when we look at example four, if we're given that f of x is equal to x squared plus four and g of x is equal to the square root of x, 
and we know that the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared plus 4 is 4, and that we got that just by plugging in, in 0 or direct substitution, and if we know that the limit as x approaches 4 of the square root of x is equal to 2, then we also know that the limit as x approaches 0 of g of f of x is really equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x squared plus 4, which equals 2. Now theorem 1.6 deals with limits of trig functions, and essentially a trig function is no different than the previous functions that we've talked about where you can use direct substitution. So for instance, the limit as x approaches c of sine of x is equal to the sine of c. Again, direct substitution. Same thing with the limit as x approaches c of the tangent of x is equal to tangent of c, and so on. So if we look at example 5, part a, the limit as x approaches 0 of tan x, using direct substitution, this is really equal to the tangent of 0, and if you recall from your unit circle, the tangent of 0 is equal to the sine of 0 over the cosine of 0. Sine of 0 was 0. Cosine of 0 was 1. So this is all equal to 0. For part b, we have the limit as x approaches pi of x times the cosine of x. Now this is really equal to the limit as x approaches pi of x times the limit as x approaches pi of the cosine of x. So when we simplify these pieces and I do direct substitution, we end up with pi times the cosine of pi, which is a negative 1. So I end up with pi times a negative 1, which equals a negative pi. And last but not least, we have part C that says the limit as x approaches 0 of sine squared x. This is really um, written, or you should rewrite it, as the limit as x approaches 0 of the quantity of sine x squared. And with direct substitution, we get the sine of 0 squared, and the sine of 0 is 0, and 0 squared is still 0. And the last thing we're going to look at in the first part for today is a strategy for finding limits. Now, looking at theorem 1.7, it says let c be a real number and let f of x equal g of x for all x that's not equal to c. Okay, if the limit of g of x as x approaches c exists, then the limit of f of x also exists. So, in other words, if you remember back to pre-calc, sometimes you can use direct substitution, but not directly. And I will we'll go over how to do that here in the next example. So example 6 says to find the limit as x approaches 1 of x cubed minus 1 divided by x minus 1. Well, if you go in to do direct substitution, you're going to end up with 1 minus 1 divided by 1 minus 1, which is 0 over 0. And if you recall from last year, 0 divided by 0 is an indeterminate form, which tells us that we have to do something else to further simplify this. So what we can do is we can simplify x cubed minus 1, and we can rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 1, and this is going to take you back to your Algebra 2 days, but you can do it. x cubed minus 1 is really x minus 1 times the quantity of x squared plus x plus 1, all divided by x minus 1. So what's going to happen is our x minus 1s are going to cancel out, and we're going to be left with the limit as x 
approaches 1 of the quantity of x squared plus x plus 1. And when I do that, I have a polynomial, and I we talked about earlier that you can take the limit of a polynomial through direct substitution, so we end up with 1 plus 1 plus 1, for a limit, equal to 3. So graphically, when you look at the two graphs, one of our original function, which is right here, this is of our simplified function, we pretty much have the same graph. The only discrepancy is this point here. In our original function, our function was undefined at the point x equals 1. When we simplified our function, we now have a continuous function because it's a polynomial. And it's also true at the point x equals 1. So we're really finding the limit of the same function. It just, our first one had a discontinuity. This one is continuous. So to wrap things up for today, uh, kind of a general strategy when you're looking at limits is one, I think the more that you do of these, you'll kind of eventually be able to see which problems you can use direct substitution with. And then, in, in course, you'll also be able to find out which ones you can't. And if you can't, then you're going to have to start looking at things like factoring um, or some other methods that you're going to see tomorrow. Um, we can also use theorem 1.7. And then, of course, you can always graph or use a table to reinforce either your conclusions or the work that you've already done. So that wraps up our part A of section 1.3. I'm going to apologize. I didn't have a fun fact for you today, but I did find a fun funny. So your fun funny for the day is this cartoon. If you guys uh, have any questions, let me know tomorrow. Otherwise, have a good night, and we will see you later.